light within our hearts, light within our thoughts, light within our words. May one and all and everything, blessed and loved, ever be. Welcome. I am Sister Who. With me today on the show, I have my friend Samuel Nez, and we wanted to discuss the topic of maintaining cultural identity within ever-increasing global community. It seems that because of international uh, communication, travel, and commerce, humanity is absolutely on a collision course with global community. And it would seem because of the diversity of people involved, there's going to be uh, a diversity of religions, a diversity of languages, a diversity of everything. Somehow it has to find a way to get along. And in the midst of that, we come back to the basic question of who are we as collective groups of people? Um, or are we throwing out all collective groupings and labels and simply becoming an entire planet of diverse individuals? And if so, even if we were going to go that route, it, how would one begin to form such an identity? But for the moment, we want to focus, to scratch the surface, if you will, during the next half hour on how can one integrate a cultural identity with peaceful global community? Maybe you want to say a word or two about your own background uh, on this subject also. Um, well, I'm from the Navajo Reservation in Shiprock. Um, my father is uh, full Diné. Shiprock, New Mexico. Shiprock, New Mexico. Okay. Uh, my father is uh, full Diné, which is the Navajo people. Uh, and my mother is uh, one half Mexica, which would be uh, the indigenous people of Mexico. Okay. Um, so I grew up with uh, both the cultures um, at hand. And so being multicultural and, all and watching how the... Which, just a brief note on language, mm -hmm. um, so that people don't forget, there was a time not that terribly long ago mm -hmm. when being called a half-breed that that was a pejorative, uh, a word that is used specifically to devalue or put somebody down. It would seem to me that the general category of half-breeds uh, now around the world pretty much outnumbers any pure race because, you know, going back to global community, everything is becoming very mixed. Mm -hmm. And people of different tribes and different nations and different races are falling in love and getting married and having kids. and. There's, there's no pure race hardly anywhere anymore. Oh, no. But at one time, being called a half-breed was a very horrible thing to say to someone. Oh, yeah. Now it's, there's still a lot of difficulty there, but there's, there's an obvious progression with how the global community is actually coming together. Um, Have I, you run into anything yourself with the two tribes that, to which you need to relate? Um... Uh, off and on, I have, but back when, there, there are stories of how the Mexica people and the Navajo people communicated, and it's not so outspoken now, but there's, there's evidence behind it. And now it's just, well, those are your people, and these are my people, and we're still separate, but we can be friends in such a sense. Does that make sense? So you're saying they were collaborative neighbors in the past? In the past. And now they're collaborative neighbors again. Somewhat or not as much? But only beca because of the, the progression of the world and how we ha have so much communication between each other. But was there a time where they were much more at odds and, and uh, adversarial to each other? Not to my understanding. Um, okay. There was, there was so integration. They're just kind of continuing it, but, but very much for you and for those two tribes and for everyone else. How do you retain cultural identity? in an increasingly global community where, you know, pretty soon we will get to the point where everybody is a half-breed or a quarter-breed or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I myself have four grandparents from four different countries. You know, two of them happen to be uh, France and Germany who are still, if you go to Europe, are still verbally throwing rocks at each other. You know, I, in my case, uh, I had uh, a grandfather and a grandmother, French and German, who got married and had, you know, lots of kids. Mm -hmm. 
So they pretty much ignored the whole fight and merged. But that would leave me in the situation of not being able to return completely to either side. See, that, that reminds me of a, a quote um, by the author of uh, Dr. Jackal and Mr. Hyde on, in each of us, uh, two natures are at war. Okay. But I think it's up to us, our, our self-identity and our cultural identity, on when we decide to, to end that war. And it all blends into that, that global community well, within ourselves. How do we end the war without losing track of who we are? That, that's a hard one, hard one to say, but really it's about the, the integration of the future. And like with me, I blend my two cultures, and to me they blend perfectly. Okay. And at what point can our global community blend our cultures together and to form a strong one? <clears throat> okay. So in, uh, in addressing this blending, is it looking for things that seem a little bit alike? Is it noticing things that are strikingly different and then putting them next to each other? Uh, you know, like putting a, a candle next to a table lamp and saying they both work. You know, the, the candle, they both give light, but the candle I'm including more because I like the fragrance. The lamp, because I need enough light to read my book. Uh, you know, so they both have a pragmatic reason for being there. They may have an aesthetic reason, you know, they each have a different kind of beauty to bring to the space. When we're talking about cultural identity, though, how do we merge them without creating mush? Well, it's to my understanding that cultural identity is about um, our, our, our past as a, as a group, as a people, Okay. our stories, um, and then finally our interpretation of said stories, not only of our past, but our myths and our legends. And the relevance that we assign to the stories. Exactly. And so to, to bring in the, the idea of interpretation, when we, when we understand that there's more than one interpretation, mm -hmm. to me that's when that, that integration can happen. Because interpretation, people, well, I interpret this as being black and this as being, being white. Mm -hmm. When can we understand that? There's just more than one interpretation. It's black and, and, and it's white. Okay. Well, I think some of it is noticing the underlying challenges that affect all peoples and how we've come up with different answers and different responses, but we're really dealing with the same basic challenge. Mm -hmm. We've just answered it in different ways. And so there might be a future time where we have a panel discussion where people will say, well, this is the challenge, and this is how these people would answer it, and these people, and these people, and these people, and these people. And out of those five different possible answers, we get to pick another answer yet for our own time and place. That would make sense to me. The... The challenge, I guess, still comes uh, in, first of all, being able to recognize that cultural identity that's wonderful, how to continue to embrace it without it becoming a stumbling block between yourself and someone who's radically different. You know, how in a global community, the Japanese can go on being Japanese, and the Norwegians can go on being Norwegian, and the... Uh, Lakota Sioux can go on being Lakota Sioux, and uh, you know, the indigenous people all over the world can go on being who they are, without without their cultural identity becoming a stumbling block between them and others. Mm -hmm. Some, numerous times throughout human history, uh, various peoples and countries have decided to be more isolationist. We're going to maintain our purity by not associating with anybody else, which generally only works for a time and then becomes more problematic than helpful. Uh, you know, especially when they're really not keeping track of each other or when some disaster happens and they need to rely upon each other, but they, have no, they haven't built any relationship. Uh, there have been numerous comments made over the last 150 years, and I'm not 
I'm not suggesting by any means that that is the only part of history to focus upon. Uh, because there's a lot of rich cultural history that extends beyond that. Within that transitional time, though, there was often the comment made of whether allowing, oh, I hate the terminology, but allowing outsiders to know the cultural practices, whether that was somehow giving away one's cultural identity. Mm -hmm. Um I guess where I would take an issue with the person who received it is if they went out and began saying that they were doing such and such practice. And, you know, but to me it's just as ridiculous as someone saying, um, I, re I read and understand the original biblical manuscripts the same way that Jesus did. And I would say, reality check. They lived in a time of different values, different nuances. The words had, you know, even over the course of 50 years, words take on very different meanings. To say that you have the same understanding that somebody 2,000 years ago had, there is absolutely no way to prove that or, or disprove it. There's, But there are so many things that work against it, it becomes a total leap of faith to say that. Mm -hmm. So if someone were to say, someone who was not by birth Native American, to say, I am practicing a Native American ritual, I would say, oh, are you? <laughs> you may think so. But going back to this point of, is it taking something from, I guess what I'm, what I'm getting at, and you know, feel free to interrupt me at any point as mm -hmm. thoughts come to mind, does, is the legitimate and true devalued or minimized by the presence of too many imposters? There will probably always be imposters in the world. Oh, yes. The intelligent people, to me, will understand the difference between the imposter and the authentic. I... I guess within a global community that raises the question though, what is the recommendable response to imposters? You know, if somebody goes out into a global communal setting and begins making claims that are clearly ridiculous, is the global community going to say, excuse me, you're blowing smoke. <laughs> you know, if, if, if you'll allow me to use that expression. Uh, you know that it's the idea that you're you're saying things that don't have any basis, no backing, no legitimacy, no truth to them. You're making claims that are unsupportable. Well, that that being said, about w including the imposters and like uh, how how would it be put? What what gives you the right to say such things? Mm -hmm. um, to retain one's own cultural identity in this. This this global community that's that is being formed mm -hmm. slowly but surely. <clears throat> it, it's it's about looking um, looking at works best with you. So if somebody was clearly not Native American, but they were practicing Native American rituals and Native American processes and archetypal analogies. It, well, I would say that they may be doing something that was inspired by those. Exactly, but it's it's important but it's too. Not, but I wouldn't allow them to say that they were doing the actual. You know, if if in fact they weren't doing the actual, they were simply doing their own version of it. Mm -hmm. Then they need to own the fact that what they're doing was inspired by, but ultimately is just their personal version. It, it, that's where the integration comes in. Okay. But but not on such a level where it takes over. Make it takes over. takes over. So, uh, somebody who, somebody who didn't grow up in the traditions or the in the indigenous traditions mm -hmm. of of Native American peoples, and there's, there's I think around over five hundred different uh, fed, federal, uh, federally acknowledged tribes. Okay, that's a lot of different traditions. 
and we, you can pick and choose. So there's but, enormous diversity in oh, North America long before the Europeans ever got here. Exactly. And then when you bring in the European uh, sections of it. It's another two or three hundred at least. Exactly. So uh, at what point are you going to find your background, your indigenous background, and then bring in bits and pieces of others that could work and, be, and blend? I bring in my traditions with, with one another, and it's because they work with each other. I choose to formally practice my Mashika traditions and bring in my Navajo traditions and vice versa. And you've found ways that to integrate them that are respectful to each. Exactly, and I could even say I, I grew up um, Catholic. Okay. And I still, I still take the Catholic traditions and blend it with all, with all of mine. Uh, an example I could use is um, I remember being in Catholic church and they, they, have, they have the frankincense burning and okay. it swings back and forth and they're doing the their center, ceremony yeah. mm -hmm. and in a lot of Native American um, ceremonies or cultures or traditions they have bundles of sage or some sort of herb that they're lighting on fire mm -hmm. and the smoke is swinging back and forth mm -hmm. and then in the Mexica traditions we have copal. All of those to me blend together. It's a sense of smoke, it's a sense of Okay. There's something behind that that gives it gives it right and gives it power. Well, I grew up in all of those traditions, so I can blend them. And along the way, somebody may show me something else, and I may be inspired by that and add it to mine, but not as my general focus. So do you believe that you're able to blend them because you grew up in them, or because you have a deeper understanding that informs you about what is a good blend and what is a bad blend? I would say both. Okay. Uh, because I did grow up with all three of those, so I but do have the understanding. if someone did not grow up within it, does that restrict their legitimacy of using it? No. Okay. The, the restrictions are from the, the individual person. Okay. It's when we, when we decide to open our minds and, and allow the integration of ourselves with others while keeping ourselves and keeping that person. So you have black and you have white, put them together. Okay. Let them blend just a little bit, but they're still separate, and then you end up with the grayscale, and that's, to me, that's, that's the global community. You have black on one end, you have white on the other, and you have everything else in between, and that's the connection. And everybody belongs someplace. Exactly. So, I, I guess to go back to the accusation of somebody, quote, stealing someone else's culture, is that a legitimate accusation, or, or what exactly were they talking about when they said that? Or was it more just that the people whose the people whose religious traditions were inspiring them were a people who was already feeling uh, the effects of cultural genocide, mm -hmm. uh, you know, having their culture under attack because of uh, a conqueror that wanted to impose a new system, you know, and if you look at the whole of human history, it. it it almost looks like uh, the history of humanity is the sequence of one group of people displacing another at more or less regular intervals, and each time forcing whoever loses through some sort of cultural shift that they had neither anticipated nor desired nor welcomed. But of course, those sorts of conquests always change us. You know, hopefully we're getting beyond the point of needing to con to conquer each other on the purely physical violent war means, war level. Um, but there seems to be a lot of economic and ideological conquest going on yet. Mm -hmm. of, of how ideas and practices and regional or national laws are demanding a certain minimum of conformity that may sometimes be at odds with particular cultural identities. With that being said, like, like we had said earlier, mm -hmm. it is a slow but sure process with this global community. And but, but the thing we're really trying to get at today is how do we make it a constructive and empowering process? I mean, I don't know if that's coming out clearly in our discussion, but to... I guess, first of all, the, the assumption I think we both would agree on is that 
cultural identity and global community are not mutually exclusive terms. No, they're not. You can have cultural identity and still be a good neighbor to everyone else in the global community. But does that mean that every, every good neighbor is going to be a good neighbor back? Um, we would hope, but I don't <laughs> think, but that's probably a little bit too optimistic. On the flip side, I don't think we should resort to pure cynicism and insist that everyone's going to stab you in the back, so don't trust anyone. Right. To have global community, we have to find ways to accomplish trust. It would seem that within every cultural identity, there are some things that are casual and there are some things that are very central and sacred. And it is imperative, extremely important, that we respect what the others consider sacred. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we will be, perhaps inadvertently, but nonetheless, we will be communicating disrespect for those people. We'll be treating them as second-class citizens. We'll be treating them as less than the marvelous creatures they are. Uh, in a sense, we'll be embracing our own blindness, you know, and not seeing the beauty and the majesty and the wisdom uh, that this particular group has concentrated, mm -hmm. collected, um, almost like, uh, well, in, in theological cir circles, they would refer to it as a canon, but it's, it's like a collection of ideas and books and writings and so forth that form the core of the knowledge and understanding of the people. Uh, many indigenous cultures, of course, were oral cultures. Things were not written down. They were memorized and remembered and repeated from one generation to another. Mm -hmm. And there was even something about the retelling of the stories over and over and over that allowed, uh, that, that made it real because they had to participate. It was active listening and active speaking. It wasn't, go read a book. It wasn't, uh, well, you should know. It was active speaking and listening. So the written Navajo language is fairly new. And okay. so I'm pretty familiar with the oral traditions because not, not all Navajos can, or the Diné people can, can read Navajo. It's because it wasn't a written language for it, so long. Like, like you're saying, it's an oral, it's an oral tradition. What makes, what makes it so real is not only how it's told, but the interpretations of it. Okay. Like, like, like mentioned before, um, an example would be, I'm pretty sure, uh, culturally after February, you don't tell any stories, uh, the old traditional stories to anybody because it's, it's taboo, but that's what makes it real. And then during certain times of the year, or during certain months, you would make sure to tell your children that you would have to repeat exactly what it was. It's, you're hanging on to it, but you're also sharing it at the same time. And if we could do that in the global community, hang on to something and share it. Well, it sound, from what you just described, it sounds like the Navajo created annual cycles. Yes. Certain seasons for telling stories, certain seasons for not telling stories, certain seasons for doing anything, mm -hmm. and certain seasons during which those things would not be done. Yes. I guess what I would invite for, for everybody within those circles and, and outside of them is more dialogue about why would the forefathers and foremothers, uh, why would the ancestors have made those associations? You know, what is it about spring that means this? And what is it about autumn that means this? And something must have inspired them to make those associations. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they're not here to tell us. So we have, to, based on what has been passed down, based on what we can project or, or imagine about their, the time these ideas were first set down, it's important to give it some serious thought and realize that there quite possibly was some really deep wisdom behind it. And if you don't know that deep wisdom, it becomes more problematic to try to modernize or update or change anything. In reacquiring that deep wisdom, hopefully 
wisdom will continue to guide the current and future uh, choices of creating and maintaining cultural identity. Mm -hmm. And it's not always about safekeeping that, that wisdom, but what can we learn from it mm -hmm. to, build, to build that global community? So I, I understand what you're saying. Any final comments as we wind up this topic? And I, I hope I haven't dominated the conversation too much. Oh, um, no. <laughs> um, anything that you think is especially important for people to understand um, about this integration of cultural identity and global community? Uh, remember, remembering where you came from and applying that to where you're going along with other people. Meeting other people on the road, but remembering which road you took. Yes because that too will inform future decisions. Yep. You know, and, and respecting that other people have taken diverse roads also. And perhaps remembering to learn about what their paths have been. And the more we learn about each other, it doesn't necessarily change us, but it certainly does change our ability to understand each other. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for watching.